Aloha. I'm Aisha Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey. And as you know, we have been learning all about cannabis and that it was the fruit or fruit of the gods for 10,000 years in Asia and all over the world. And so for us here, we're just learning. We're just beginning to discover this plant that was used for medicine, for food, for religious practices, for everything that you can imagine. And then here comes dear old Uncle Sam and just screws it all up. Just unbelievable what they did by making it illegal. So now we are in the process of learning all of the wonderful things that cannabis can do from this plant that just grows. And so we on this show have been talking about this and learning from the people that really understand the plant and what it does. And today, one of my dear friends who really understands the plant, Theo Alexander. Theo, are you there? I'm here. How's it going, Marsha? Thanks for having me. So you're on Maui today. I'm on Maui today. It's very beautiful. Nice weather over here. Want to check out some properties? So what are you looking for? Well, I'm actually looking for some properties where um, some people are interested in actually growing the USDA certified hemp oh, to get great. into the, uh, the, the hemp market. So trying to help some guys um, with their license process and um, also giving them a, a good consult just as far as what they can do on their property. Uh, but yeah, just having some fun over here, you know, getting out into the to the to the up country, uh -huh. you know, and enjoying the beautiful weather. So it um, is. That's a lovely. On the phone, they'll talk about something really important. That is really wonderful uh, yes. to look for. Uh, but of course, you know, the climate is different on every island, and so what would grow very well on one island would probably grow something different. I think. Given the climate and the soil, the hemp that would grow on the Big Island or some parts of the Big Island and mm -hmm. upcountry Maui and Molokai would be totally different because of the yes. climate and the soil. Yes, in the soil, yeah. 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 That much I know about growing any kind of plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, hemp doesn't need much water, so you don't have to worry about that. Right, about a third of the water uses of the other crops, yeah. So how long from the time you put the seed in the ground until it's ready for harvest? How long is that? Uh, it depends on if you're growing indoors or outdoors. Uh, no, let's, um, let's on, see, on your, uh, as hemp, outside in Maui, how long would that take? Would you get a crop? Um, how many crops a year would you get? It depends on your growing season here in Hawaii. Of course, it's year-round. You could probably get maybe four, four harvests out, you know, if, you, if you're really pushing it. Uh, every three months, you can harvest. But of course, if you're indoors, you can do it every two weeks. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, no, let's, let's talk. I can't imagine growing hemp indoors, but outside. Now, yes. so you get the license from the Department of Agriculture who says you have to have 10 acres. Yes, and, the limit is 10 acres. Yes. 10 acres or less, yes. And so now that you plant the seed, then it grows, then you harvest, and what happens after the harvest? After then, um, I believe they give you a certain time frame of the license yes. um, that you have to abide by. Uh, you have to have a buyer for mm -hmm. your biomass or whatever you're going to do with your product after harvest. So you have, to um, identify, then, you have to identify the buyer before you, when you get the license. Is that what you're telling yes, me? Yes, it will be wise to do so because, of course, hemp, you know, it grows very fast. Three months ago, you know what I'm saying, pretty quick. So... Um, if, you, if you don't have someone set up already before you put seed in, it's going to be kind of hard to, to find someone to buy it, you know, uh, if you're doing acreage. Um, I mean, sometimes it can run from several thousand to maybe a couple million, you know, depending on what type of hemp you're growing. So you, will, you do want to be in line with the buyer uh, prior to even putting in a license because it's kind of an A to Z process. You want to be able to plant the seed after you get the license, but also have everything intact in the business process. And it is a business process. It Your is. end goal is to sell the biomass. So or, you're gonna or process it. So yeah. you're gonna get the seed, you get the license. Do they give you the seed or do where does the seed come from? 
Um, you have two opportunities for the seed. You can go with what the UH pilot program has. I think they have maybe four varietals or cultivars of seed, mm -hmm. including Yuma. Uh, I think some of it's coming from China, some of it coming from here uh, in Hawaii. But um, you can also apply you know, or, or request seed from outside of, of Hawaii, outside of the state. Um, the people who are bringing the genetic in, uh, once the request is fulfilled, they can bring the genetic in through certain processes to the oh. USDA. Uh, okay. It has to be a certified seed, though. Oh, yeah. So, okay, now we've got the seed in the ground and it's harvest time. Then, yes. So you already identified your buyer. Then the yes. buyer uh, takes it to a factory and it turns it into whatever product you want. Is that? Yes, that's, yes, that's, that's, that's correct. So that correct. you would identify the product you want at the time of the license? Yeah, so what we do with our consult is uh, when, gentlemen, when when people are interested in getting the license, we'll walk them through the process first, get them familiar with the rules and regulations and the penalties as well. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll ask them, what type of program do you want to run? Some people want to grow the hemp and process it all the way through into a finished product or a CBD product. Some people just want to grow for, just for the biomass. Some people want to grow for seed uh, to uh, supply other growers with, with seed uh, from Hawaii. So. It depends on what program you want to run, what you want to do with the end product. So we just consult from that aspect. And once we discover those things, we walk into a business plan and we fulfill what the needs are and what whatever um, the profitable situation, whatever the profit is that the person is shooting towards, whatever the target market is, we'll try to uh, manage from that point. So if you wanted, you were talking about biofuel. So then um, I read that the military is interested in hemp as a biofuel. So would you, ha would you have them as part of the, I guess what we're saying, a, some kind of secure uh, statement from them, the, yes, we're going to buy your product at the end. Yes, I, I know. as far as DOD or the military or anything like that, I don't know, you know exactly what their intention is, given it's a USDA commodity. I'm sure they, they're looking at some of the things. Um, they, of course, they have large amounts of acreage. Some of the bases that have closed down mm -hmm. across the United States can be utilized for this aspect, uh, retools, so to say. Um, I can't speak for them, but just as far as the biomass opportunity to have biofuel, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you refer to Henry, Henry Ford, you know, in the, in the 1920s, he built his car with him, you know, right. all the composites, and then it ran on him fuel. So, yes, it is a very... You know, it's an opportunity to be able to grow uh, biomass for biofuel at this point in time. And I think a lot of energy companies are looking at that. Uh, Hawaii, I believe, is one of the ones that's looking at biofuel. Uh, now, let's go back to the seeds. So if you're using the plant for seed, mm -hmm. uh, then tell me, would it make sense to say Hawaiian whatever? Would that sell around the world just because it is Hawaiian seed? I mean, the name is precious. The name is gold. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, most people do want a variety or cultivar from Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, assuming that it comes with all the tropical goodness that other things come from, like our fruit. It's very sweet uh, compared to other parts of the world, possibly. Um, yeah, just like with the the cousin, you know what I'm saying, to hemp uh, cannabis. Right. When you think about Maui Wiley, you know, and other, other strains that are grown here, uh, and I made it. Are pretty much famous across the United States and across the world. Um, people coming here looking for those cultivars. So hemp is going to be much the same. Um, if we're able to grow a seed crop here and able to export it uh, to people who are interested in growing hemp, I'm sure there will be a commodity that we could trade, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at a high value. So that's where we're intending on. I'm, I'm really looking at operations where we can do seed uh, crop. Seed crop, yeah. That yes. makes sense to me. I, yes. Yeah. That, and if you know how to do it. now. I understand that Kentucky and North Carolina, once tobacco, which was for hundreds of years their big crop, now that there's all of this anti-tobacco, that they are growing hemp that yes. is just taken off. Just yes, hundreds they're, of years. They're, their programs are amazing. I mean, all the colleges and the USDA, you know, uh, the State Departments of Ag are all involved. They're working in unison to make this opportunity for the next generation to build generational wealth, you know what I'm saying, sustainability with farming again. 
So in their high value that you're getting off the land per acre, it's attracting a lot of different people who are shutting down their uh, past farming operations to renew um, their interest in hemp or the profitability that comes with it. Um, I, I think it's a great thing. North Carolina, they have a huge, I think they have one of the nation's uh, largest uh, processing plants right now, well, production plant. They also have a university in North Carolina. North Carolina. Uh, yes, we yes. had him on the show once and uh, when we first started talking about hemp. And year round, of course, they don't have a year round crop like we, we right, would. Right. But they are crowded. People, he said, housewives, everybody is, is at, enrolled in the university. Yes. I mean, if you think about agricultural programs throughout the United States, um, with my generation, of course, your generation grew up farming, doing, doing for self, being sustainable. We have the property. Uh, at one point in time, colleges, you know, getting a better education to get a better job. You know, the parents wanted the, the kids to go out and have a better life than they had. Working the farm is very hard labor, can be. And so um, with that said, you know, they wanted a better way of life for their children. That's why they worked so hard for that. Now that the children have degrees and the job market is not as what it should be, or what they thought it would be. Um, a lot of times they're looking at different ways to utilize a property if they still have it in the, in, the, in the family name, if they haven't sold it yet. So hemp is renewing people's opportunity to return to their farmland or to their ag land and plant and, and, and be profitable and sustainable for the next generation. So it's giving people a very, very um, valuable opportunity to, to do this, you know, and that's why that's what brought my interest because I was one of the people who was sent to go to college, you know, and got my degree, got my master's degree, worked in healthcare for a long time. But, you know, jobs are not plentiful at the level of healthcare um, that I achieved at the corporate level. And so one thing I wanted to do is find a way that I can be a better steward to the land. Because so I grew up, you know what I'm saying, with farming and agriculture and horses and, and cattle and things like that there in Oklahoma. So um, it was only, you know, key for me to just do a whole 360 and bring that back to bear, which Oklahoma has done. We were leading the industry and applications for hemp. And, it's got, and, and cannabis as well. And so that just kind of piqued my interest. So I often go back and forth to Oklahoma to get better ideas of what we can do here in Hawaii. You know, and um, as far as the legislation there, um, we have very good uh, legislators in Congress that is working together to make it profitable and make it uh, sustainable. Uh, for instance, um, if you did want to get the uh, cannabis card there in um, Oklahoma, the 788 law enables you to do that. But what we did was pass legislation for people to retain their firearms rights. Um, oh. That's one thing that, that Oklahoma's being very progressive on because we have some gun owners and some gun lovers in Oklahoma because a lot of hunters there. So, you know, having to give up your license um, or your gun, you know, it, it's, it's just not kosher. It didn't sit well with people. So we, we acted, you know, saying as a community to, um, to fix that, you know, and to make it available for people to retain their guns. Because look, if you start growing hemp or cannabis, you need to protect your property, you know. Oh, of course you do. <laughs> So I mean that's one good thing that we did there in Oklahoma, but I mean, but to the point, I, I believe that the hemp program is going to bring the United States agriculture, um, the value well, of agriculture, back to bear. Well, I think, and we've talked about this before, that it can be an industry, a full-on industry, not just, but so that uh, kids in school now can learn about a growing about being right. a scientist about right. all of the products that can be made from hemp 50,000 right. products that can be made it seems to me that if the health department would get out of the way and they are in the way if the health department would get out of the way it could be a game changer yes. where kids could grow into this industry and stay here instead of right. like my sons all live and work someplace else. They went away to school and got married and that's it. Of and course, and of that's course. the same in so many families. So if, right. if the hemp industry, I mean, could be a real industry that kids could learn how to, from the very beginning, uh, science, engineering, yes. product design, uh, all of the things that would take it to be a real industry, then people can stay exactly. home. They can stay exactly. there. Exactly. I mean, you bring up the health department. I mean, I, oh. I don't want them to be involved. A lot of people want them to be involved. I think if they put better resources towards um, educating their 
answering the questions that society or the Hawaii uh, people are asking, mm-hmm. whether it be patient, whether it be farmer, if we can get um, the USDA and, 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 and DOH to kind of work together on their definitions and what the distinction is between CBD medicines for health, <laughs> well, agricultural health, yeah. you know what I'm saying, for profitability and, and well, uh, use let's, of ag land. So. I need to take a break, but yes. when we come back, when 60 seconds, and let's talk about the health department and the problems with the health department, okay? We'll be okay. right back. Don't go away. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, and we're back. We're talking to Theo Alexander, who is today on Maui with some people looking at properties that are available to grow hemp. So, Theo, are you still there? I am here. Okay. Now, last month, the Department of Health had a, said that the legality and manufacturing and dis- distribution of con- cannabis products in the state had resulted in a measure of public confusion. And I was thoroughly confused when they said that CBD wasn't legal. CBD mm-hmm. products were not legal. Yes. In Hawaii. Uh, yes. But they were legal in every other state. And now, all of a sudden, they put out this press release without any real thing to back it up, nothing to base it on. Uh, 50 states says it's legal. Now, and Janice Okubo, Department of Health Communications Director, said, the farm bill, and I quote, the farm bill made hemp cultivation legal, but it retains the authority of the FDA over cannabis-derived products. Hemp is cannabis. That's what she said. Hemp is cannabis. Yes. Hemp. You know, I mean, I think everybody's doing their best to get their hands around this. Uh, when they had the opportunity to get out in front of it with education, uh, PSAs, public service announcements, and other things they could have did, when there was experts in the state coming to the hemp conference and to the cannabis conferences to offer their expertise, uh, I think they try to take advantage of it, but uh, not speaking for them, but I think they could do a little better, you know, uh, put a little bit more resources towards their educational materials and also towards um, getting people the right information. Patients are still asking what the difference between hemp and CBD and cannabis is, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of questions out there, you know, so. Now, um, what, what, I, think, I, what yeah. I learned from you, Hemp does not have the level of THC that medical cannabis has. Yes, the distinction um, regarding the USDA or FDA, um, cannabis is anything above 0.3% THC by dry weight. Anything below 0.3% THC by dry weight is considered USDA commodity or hemp. Mm -hmm. So there is a distinction because of the level of THC. Right. There is a distinction, okay? So a lot of people don't understand that. They see the below 3% THC. They say it's THC, it's, it's cannabis anyway, because it has a little bit of THC in it, which is not true. Uh, look at the definition of what the USDA has put out. And that's what we have to go on. Now, with the FDA, uh, in my opinion, I think the FDA, what they're wanting to regulate more is the synthetic market for CBD. 
What is, um, what, is say, what is a now synthetic market as opposed to a real market? There's um, synthetic meaning that the the, the the cannabis or the cannabinoid or the CBD is derived from a laboratory um, process. So it's a chemical process, uh, much like FDA designs their drugs. It's a chemical process, right? Um, as opposed to uh, hemp derived uh, extractions, which is a botanical process, which is ah. the natural plant medicine. It's the natural out of the plant. Soil. Oh, I it's get. It's a natural plant. So I, I think the trouble is, oftentimes our authorities that that are that are legislating, they're not making a distinction between what I consider fake CBD or synthetic CBD. Um, that's probably 85 cent in the market right now. You know, it's kind of out of hand as far as how many people are manufacturing it, whether it be in their, in their garage, whether it be in their kitchen. You know, some people are doing it right and above par when it comes to uh, formulating, you know what I'm saying, with the FDA standards and doing it inside a laboratory, things like that. But the danger with synthetics is yet to be known. Um, we're going to see that with the induction of Epidiolex, which is a formulary drug that the FDA approved, you know what I'm saying, about a year ago. So we're going to see what kind of side effects, you know what I'm saying, it, 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 it's going to um, impose on the, the public, you know. We've already seen some cases where people are getting sick, you know, and, and causing quality control, you know. Um, they're having some adverse side effects with the medications they're already on by prescription. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see how that plays out. But, and, 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 you know, my role, you know, that I would like to play um, with the distinction between CBD uh, hemp-derived and CBD synthetic-derived is to help the Department of Health and the USDA um, understand that you need to make the distinction for the public. You yes. have to have an understanding, you know what I'm saying, in the back office and talking to the FDA, you know what I'm saying, on a relationship basis or talking to the USDA on a relationship basis with the, the patients and the consumers don't have that opportunity. Um, there's only literature put out. Sometimes that literature is, is questionable. Uh, as I said, you know, when people talk about CBD, some of the headlines just say CBD. It doesn't distinguish whether that's formulary CBD whether that's uh, synthetic, you know, whatnot, or whether that's hemp derived or botanically derived. And so that's what Camo, you know, and, and many of us that are advocates for this, um, this potentially great market, you know, is to distinguish between what's harmful and what's safe. Yes. Um, you know what I mean? Because uh, National Institutes of Health, World Health Organization, uh, several different well accredited, you know, say organizations that have been with us decades have said this is the safest medicine in the world. Uh, known to man, but they're talking about botanically derived, not synthetic. Synthetic, we don't know about. We're finding out. That's oh. the one that they need the regulation or the extended testing on. Uh, of course, you still need extended testing on the botanical derived uh, CBD, but I think it's less harmful. And we've shown that, you know what I'm saying, through processing and through the use, utilization of it. This is why um, last year, uh, President Trump signed the 2018 Farm Bill and excluded CBD botanically derived from the uh, Schedule One list. You know the cannabis is still on as far as CAC. Uh, oh, I see. Well, so I mean, we just need a better understanding of what the difference is, and I think if they focused on that, they would cut down some of the confusion and some of the propaganda that's being put out. Yeah, and so if you have people making things in their kitchen, how would you know if it's the real thing or not? How how did um, there, there, there's tests that you can do. Uh, Steve Hill, you know, uh, yeah, I know Steve, yeah, we've, we've uh, been Dan to is Steve. a really good friend, you know, and he, he's tested some of my product to, to make sure that it's um, below 0.3% to your seeing it was. And so, um, the way they can distinguish, I would have to refer uh, or defer to, to uh, Steve Hill to ask them what is the test that you can apply that says synthetic that would tell you if it's synthetic or botanical. I, I don't have the knowledge of that. I know there is a test, well, you know, yeah. say that you can that you can take it through. So, so what, um, now this is, I'm, I'm not a baker, I, I'm the worst. But it seems what, I, what little I do know about baking is that once you create a product and you bake it, the temperature changes the molecule in the product. So if you're putting in CBD or THC in a product yes. and you bake it, how do you know what you've got now because the chemical, the molecules have been changed? Well, when, when you heat it, um, it's going to decarb. So it's going to change from TACA or CBDA to basic THC or CBD. You know, um, I'm not the scientist when it comes to that, but I know that it will change the molecular structure to where it makes it more potent. 
you know what I mean? Or it makes it more intoxicating or uh, more psycho. Oh, okay. And so, um, and I know the health department has some contention with as far as putting CBD in, in foods. Uh, recently, there were some people who was issued cease and desist orders in a few locations that were using CBD and put it into food to help people at least sample or try it. It's kind of hard to get people to try things out of a bottle or a pill when they're already used to the, the opioid crisis or oh, things yes. that are coming from prescription basis. Some people are fearful now. Oh. So it's best to try it from a nutrient point because that's what cannabis is. So that's what um, hemp derived uh, CBD is. It's a nutrient. It's the highest source of plant protein, omega-3, 6, and 9 fatty acids. Also, uh, other essential minerals like calcium, zinc, magnesium, they have all those wrapped up in this plant. And this is why it's such a good aid for chronic disease uh, alleviation or any symptom, chronic symptom alleviation. But uh, when it comes to putting it in food, um, adulterated products and things like that, the FDA has a ruling on, and they, they will not allow that. Uh-huh. And they should make the distinction between CBD and botanically derived CBD. Oh. Because botanically derived CBD is just like adding, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's the same thing as, uh, as uh, in any kind of fruit or vegetable that you want to put into an ingredient. Well, you know, so. Yeah. We are really running out of time, and. There's so much to talk about. So much, right. So much to talk about. But (laughs) now, Dr. Cliff Otto, who you know, and he's been a guest on the show for for as long as we've been on the air. And he is really working hard at having us commemorate uh, the day. Is June 14? Yes, yes. June 14. When it will be 19 years since Governor uh, Cayetano signed and made legal, I believe that. <laughs> legal, made we're, it all we're still legal, fighting and over, we're still fighting. You know, we're still fighting over the, you know, as far as how we can better understand the plant and how we can make. Yes. Especially patients who are suffering from chronic conditions, you know. Now I'll probably talk to Doctor Doctor Otto here in the next day or so to discuss uh, what he's doing for us. Yes. On the, on the, on June 14th, right? June 14. And yeah. so let us all remember that's just next week. So it is. it'll be it's, 19, it's just 19 years. Yes. And we're still, yes. the health department still didn't get it right. So that's all right. We, we're going to give them more help. <laughs> if, if they will allow us to collaborate or give them some type of aid, you know, aid us, even give us some funding, you know, make some funding available for people to help out. You know, there's a lot of intelligent people here in Hawaii that are willing to help out. And a lot of people are interested in better health choices when it comes to medication. So I think they kind of reach out to the community and, and, and show up to some of the meetings that we're asking to do. You know, some of these meetings that are working groups are serious groups. This is how we got our cannabis legislation um, available for the people to be able to use. So I would hope that they, you know, have an open mind to what's happening with CBD instead of having a restrictive mind. I mean, it is a safe medicine as well, long as botanically derived. Well, Theo, as always, it's a pleasure talking with you. And enjoy your time on Maui. And when you get back, let me know all about it. I want to hear every detail about your trip to Maui and and the farms over there. Thank you again. And aloha. We'll see you next time.